It's definitely a first world problem when you can't remember if your car's left hand drive or right hand drive. Hello one and all and welcome to Scene Through Glass and welcome back to the Jaguar XE Project 8. I'm going to blame my confusion on a little bit of tiredness. It's a relatively early start this morning because I'm headed to somewhere called DK Engineering. Now they have popped up in my videos over the years but I've never had a chance to actually visit their HQ, their headquarters, which is exactly what I'm going to be doing today and I'm super excited to go there but I'm also excited to to spend more time in this car. I know it doesn't make sense, I know it's slightly absurd, but I genuinely love this thing. Any excuse to drive it, no matter how harsh the ride is, I never want to get out of it. I, honestly, I'm falling in love with one of the weirdest cars ever made, but bravo Jaguar for making it. Well, welcome to showroom number one down here at DK Engineering. And I say showroom number one because you are not ready for how huge and endless this place is. I wasn't ready for it. I had no idea about the scale of the operation down here. It is mind blowing, but more of that to come right now, as you can see in this kind of first and maybe primary showroom, we have got Ferrari 500 Superfast, a beautiful 911 Carrera 2.7 RS lightweight. We've got a beautiful Daytona F12 TDF, all original AC Cobra behind me right here, a 250 short wheelbase. This is my Euro Millions car. If I won the lottery, this is the car I'd go and buy because I doubt I'm ever going to get to a point where I could afford this car myself. So I need a lottery win to get it. Uh, we then got a 275 GTS and of course an F40. There's a sort of theme, there's an F40 theme to this place. But right now, before we go on a further tour, I actually want to go and find James from DK Engineering. He's appeared in a few of my videos uh, over the years to have a chat and understand what these guys do. Uh, and then yes, we're going to go on a little bit of a walk around tour uh, and just take in the insane cars knocking around DK Engineering. I'm so glad I finally found time to come down here because I'm not sure how long we've been trying to plan this. Or... I think it's been about four years. It feels like yeah. that. Um, so look, thank you so much for having me. Walking around this place, I think my jaw just drops every corner I go around. But how do you summarise exactly what you do as a business? Because it seems you do a lot of different things. Yeah, so, I mean, starting from the beginning, originally, you know, my parents had cars in the, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it got to a point where their hobby they were enjoying it more, of course, than their, their day-to-day jobs. Um, and they were actually making more money out of their cars that they were you know, buying and restoring and selling and you know, reuniting original engines with you know, competition cars from the period. So they, they set the business up. And so the, the, the basis of the business is 50s and 60s Ferraris. If you look on, you know, online at the various Ferrari websites, you'll, you know, you'll go through the histories of famous 50s Ferraris, famous 60s racing Ferraris. And invariably, we will have owned them or restored them at some point. So, so cool. you know, the basis of the business is, is, is heritage, it's restoration, it's, you know, knowledge and experience. Um, and my brother and I, certainly he did in the 90s. And then when I joined sort of in the early noughties, we built the sales side of the business. Um, and yeah, these days are sort of our, our USP, I think, is that we are the only people in the world that can help you with every aspect of Ferrari. And that's not so much an age thing as well, because obviously anything under seven years old is free servicing these days, which is a bit of a blessing in disguise for us, because, you know, we just leave that to the nature. Sure, you don't, that's their you don't want the 488. Yeah. Well, no, that's their territory, and they get on with it, and they do a fabulous job, and there's just no crossover. And anything, over, yeah, and anything over seven years old, if people want to bring it to us to service, then we will. Um, you know, we gladly will. Um, but it's, it's also when it comes to, you know, guys that own cars like this, they want a one-stop shop. They don't want to t speak to one guy about transport, one guy about storage, one guy about servicing, and one guy about actually selling and buying cars. So, you know, we build relationships with clients whereby it is a one-stop shop. So we might not necessarily do everything in-house, but we can manage it. And that's, that's really what we've driven towards, especially in the last five years, is these, you know, the cars have become so much more valuable. And therefore the clientele has become actually a bit more high profile. 
um, it's really important that we can just provide that service. Are there any that really stand out in your memory, ones that you sort of wish you hadn't sold or ones that when you got in you just spent two days staring at it before you touched it? Undoubtedly there are a few that I wish were kept. I think the one that stands out, and it's, it's very easy for me to say this now because at the time it was really hard to sell, but you know, in 2009 we, we could have owned a McLaren F1 GTR for less than one and a half million pounds. And, uh, you know, we'd just moved into these showrooms and, and the, car, the car sat in the corner over there. Oh, God. And we couldn't sell it. And everyone used to come in and say, that's amazing, what but is you it? But couldn't, you couldn't sell it for the life of you? No, we couldn't. We couldn't. And, and eventually the car did get sold to someone that we had sort of introduced to it, but it was after our, our option was up. And, you know, again, that was a bit disappointing. But And now it is, because those are, what, 15, 20 million pounds now, maybe? It's difficult to say, but, I, you know... It's yeah. It's a, definitely more than a million and a half. <laughs> it's, a, it's a. It's a. It's definitely more than ten times more. Yeah, exactly. Awesome to chat. Thanks Cheers. so much. As I hinted at at the beginning, and as James just described, there is so much going on down here at DK. It's not just the sort of sale and restoration of some old Ferraris. Whilst that is a huge part of the business, there's just tons of other stuff that they're getting up to and tons of other cars. I just keep peeking through doors and windows and seeing the most amazing machinery. Right now, I've snuck into the service and restoration center so I can nerd out on some of their incredible Ferraris. But in a second, we're gonna go and look around some of the other showrooms and the storage facility, which apparently has over a hundred cars on it. And then James says he has a very special room he wants to show me. He doesn't think I'm ready for it, so maybe I need to drink some calming tea first. I don't really drink tea, but he says it's mind-blowing. I don't understand how it's going to be more mind-blowing than this. Oh, wow. I, I, like, I almost don't want to breathe in here. It's so ridiculous. I don't, I don't quite know where to start, but I think, I think, I guess we have to we have to kick off here. When you, were, when you were talking about the F1 GTR earlier, you failed to mention, oh, but we do actually have an F1 knocking around. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> we're just looking after it, so. Okay, that's beautiful in white though, it looks amazing. And it's quite nice, so many F1s over the years have been back to NSO and had a color change and been retrimmed and had this done and that done. You know, this car is one of the few that's absolutely as it was when it left the factory. Sure. Which going, you know, knowing what I know about Ferraris and old cars, Going forwards, I think that'll be a real selling point for this car, if ever it was for sale. Originality. Sure it, it won't be for sale anytime soon, I'm sure, but it's a really, you know, when we were going through the process of buying this car for the client, it was, for me, it was a really important reason as to why we should go for this particular car, because you don't find many that have been untouched. Sure, and remained super original, yeah, it looks absolutely unreal. And then, yeah, as I say, I'm, I'm almost scared to step up into this level, but I won't. <laughs> this is a 250 short wheelbase California Spider. Um, so it's the ultimate configuration being short wheelbase covered headlight. From memory, I think 22 cars were in that spec. Um, this is one of two cars that we've restored over the last three or four years. And um, again, it's, it's an example of a car that lives here with us for us to look after in between events. And then sure. we take it to events. Competition 250 GT short wheelbase. See, it's a, a later car, so it's called a CFAC hot rod, which is extremely special if you're into your short wheelbases. That's sort of as good as it gets. Um, and that's a car that we've had a long history with. I think originally, the first time we looked after it, my father bought it out of Sweden from the owners that had had it for 30 years. This was in the early 90s for his customer at the time, who was a really cool 24 year old guy um, who had some very high up connections in, in the Middle East and had great taste I and mean, he had some fabulous cars. So we, we bought that for him and then restored it for him. It lived with us for about 10 years after that. And then we sold it for him to someone else and it went to America for a 10 year stint. And then in recent years it's come back and we've been looking after it since. So we, yeah. you know, again, it's this sort of experience and knowledge, but this is a, a typical example of a car that we have had in our care on and off for you know 30 years. Unbelievable. Um, the Walt Disney Tour de France has a great story and it's got a very sort of personal backlink to our family in terms of when Walt Disney owned it after they'd finished filming The Love Bug 
At some point it was sold to one of his producers. At some point one, that producer's son took it out on Saturday night and blew it up on Mulholland Avenue wow. in, in, uh, in Hollywood and left it at the side of the road. And the car was left there for like two weeks um, because it was just an old racing car. By that time, I think it was probably you know, a number of years old and it was, yeah, it was an old racing car that no one really wanted. And, and someone who knew what it was got in top contact with him and said, look, you've left the car there for a couple of weeks, can I buy it? So in 1993, I remember we were on holiday and dad said, oh, I've got some great news. I've managed to buy the, the, the Walt Disney Tour de France and it arrived and we totally restored it then. He said it was one of the most original cars he's ever restored to the point where even the exhaust was just cleaned and painted as opposed to being replaced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then the great ending to that part of the story is that the car had to go because we all had school fees that needed pay. Yeah, yeah. So this, this car was sold to pay for my school fees That's back unreal. then. That's unreal. And then a number of years later, that same guy that we'd sold it to, he sold it to auction for a monumental thing. I said now it probably will buy the school that you went to. <laughs> yeah. Something maybe, close, yeah. <laughs> maybe it might build a boarding house. Here. Yeah, for sure. And, um, and so yeah, I always sort of, I can put a value on my education. That, that difference in price yeah, yeah, is quite yeah. a lot. Wow. Um, but it's worked out okay. I think we made the right decision. That F12 TDF over there was built as a homage to this car. Oh, no way. Right. So, so that's, for, for that is a matching F12 TDF, it basically. Is, it is the matching one, and it has a plaque in it that says Omaggio 0585, which is the chassis number of this car. So, if you, you know, you look at lots of details, like the colour combination of the interior, the, the stripe goes over the dash, and if you look at this car, you know, it's, it's been... Modernised? Modernised, but... Well, you don't see blue seats in Ferraris but, anymore, but... But, 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 but the, the sort of ethos is there. It's, it's the mm -hmm. same philosophy. You know, gold wheels is you know where we're going these days. That's popular, and and then three three six five GTC, which five. for me is 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 actually one of the most underrated '60s GT Ferraris um, because they've got great torque, great power. They're fast, they're comfortable, easy to get in and out of. T5 convertible. Okay. This was owned by Beryl Reed, and um, she owned it for a very long time, and then it was owned by another chap for a very long time, and then bought by someone else who had the factory restore it perfect perfect condition and uh, yeah, we've got it for sale at the moment there we go hey anyone who's interested um, it's got to be the best one in the world there we go there we go what well, great salesman's tactics right there um, and then finally in this room yeah so this the, is 275 gtb short nose this is one of our own cars um we've always over the years we've always had a 275 gtb of some description so this is a very nice two cam that's only done 42,000 miles from new that's only had two owners before us it's been sympathetically restored, but the interior is original and, you know, it's, it's had bits and pieces done to it over the years, but it's actually an extremely original car and, and yeah, mum and dad use this a lot for rallies and things. This I am absolutely obsessed with. Not only do I think it's absolutely stunning, but it is one of the most significant Ferrari race cars of all time. Of course, James is still here to explain why, because I know you love this car pretty much as much as I do. So give us a little tour and yeah, give me give us some of the history of this So thing. one of the earliest competition Ferraris built, 1949, not only did it win the Mille Miglia, but it also won the 24 Hours of Le Mans, which uh, I'm not sure if there's another car that's ever done that. I'm pretty sure there isn't actually. So, you know, not only did it win those two remarkable races, like a huge achievement, but it was, you know, Ferrari's first on each, which, you know, that's why Ferrari became the business it is. I think people would have picked up on that and noticed it. Um, and also a really cool story about Le Mans that Luigi Canetti Sr., he drove the car with the English owner and uh, he did 23 hours and 40 minutes of the 24 hours <laughs> because uh, no one really knows why but Lord Salston they think that he was ill or hung unwell, over. maybe hung over <laughs> so he only did 20 minutes of the whole race and, and Luigi Canetti Sr did you know yeah 23 hours and 40 minutes and In, I mean at the age of 50 as well at the he age wasn't a young of 50. man he was 50 so that's grueling you know do I do I lose touch with how special all these cars are around me and yeah, a little bit you know obviously I love them and I do appreciate them but when something like this that I you know it's, it's just an unbelievably important part of Ferrari's history when a car like that turns up you just 
you get goosebumps. And for at least a week, I kept, kept going to look at it in the workshop and yeah. have a sit at it. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not the only one because, yes, even though there are some incredible cars back here in the sort of storage area uh, of DK Engineering, this thing just stood out to me straight away. And it's, yeah, it's unbelievable to get so close to something as important as this. So, yes, thank you very much for the history lesson. <laughs> Now to finish the day off and to really demonstrate just how insane the work that DK Engineering does is, does that make sense? I'm not sure, I don't know, I'm overexcited, because you are looking at a Ferrari Mondial, probably, well, well I was going to say the most hated or maybe the most unloved Ferrari of all time, but this is no standard Mondial because, let me just come around to, yes, the open engine bay, because this car has a 430 Challenge engine. Now, that is not the only change to this car. It's also running 430 Challenge uh, gearbox. We've got different suspension, different wheels, different brakes. You will see the interior is completely redesigned. It looks more race car than road car. We've lost the rear seats for a roll cage. This is a real hot rod Ferrari. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. I don't think I've ever been near anything like it, but I love the entire concept because whilst everyone else seems to forget about the uh, wonderful Mondial, I do not. Um, and so unbelievably, I'm going to go for a very quick spin in this car as my final, final piece down here at DK Engineering. Okay, so on there, start button. <laughs> this is insane big old flappy paddle first gear and we're away i'm driving this complete i mean i don't know if it were frankenstein of a car let's just say I've been saying for a while that no one is hot rodding Ferraris and it needs to be done. You look at the Porsche community, endless modifications. Ferraris are usually left as being completely stock and standard and... <laughs> this thing is unbelievable! Now, why was this car created, you may ask? Well, apparently the owner is an exceptionally tall man. He doesn't fit in a lot of Ferraris. However, he does fit in the Mondial. He also likes doing a lot of track days. So he wanted to sort of, you know, improve the Mondial so that it was track friendly. And DK Engineering over the years were tweaking with suspension and brakes and setup. And eventually the guy said, look, the car's nearly perfect, but I want more power. So can we stick an F40 engine in it? DK said, nope. <laughs> but they got to work thinking what they could do to increase the power of a Mondial T. And they finally realized that actually a 430 Challenge was a good option because it's a relatively simple car. So you can dump the uh, engine. Once it had been completely rebuilt, they had to sort of change the entire setup and layout of that actual engine to be able to fit into the car. And they also have to change the car around, massively move fuel tanks, lose those rear seats. But they have now created this completely amazing Frankenstein car that shouldn't work, but it does. <laughs> Look at this, here we go. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's quick, people! It's quick! I'm not even revving it out. This thing will rev so far and so high, but the engine's still a little bit cold, so I'm trying to be a bit careful, but... <laughs> that was awesome. I'm so glad I got to experience that. Wow! How much? <laughs> this is so cool. Just putting that window up. Wow. Oh, I love it. I mean, it's just, it's hilarious, but brilliant. Honestly. It's just very easy to drive. It's well. so it's easy to drive. And you know, I was being a little bit careful because I realized we just turned it on, but it, it will rev if you want it to. And it's just, yeah, it's just fun and easy. And it's the best way to surprise somebody off of traffic lights. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I can well imagine this car ending up somewhere like Hong Kong, Singapore, somewhere like that, and someone just having it as like a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, which is what we call that. Brilliant. What a brilliant day. I'm so glad I came down into DK Engineering. You know, usually I'm pretty quick when I film. Uh, I spend a long time editing and I, I'm, you know, I do spend a long time filming, but I, I have a good formula. Coming here, 
I've been filming for like five hours. There was just so much to see and do, but I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, I wish I had more time in that Mondial. It was just brilliant. Uh, give it a thumbs up if you have, and make sure to subscribe for plenty more videos to come.